Welcome to the Cinema Condition. This is your host, Raul Alejandro Mendoza, or as I prefer you guys to call me, the Nerdy Chicano. And I am a filmmaker and creator of the Nerdcore Podcast Network. And we are here again to discuss another movie this week with you all. As always, on this show, I bring a guest every week and we discuss and really analyze a movie deeply to its core. And today is no different as we are looking at 2009's Summer Wars from Mamoru Hosada with none other than Claire Rodriguez. Hello. Yes, Claire (laughs) is here. She has been seen on different episodes of this feed, of the feed, you know, the other feed because it's on its separate feed. So the Nerdcore Podcast Network has seen her before. She mostly has been on the uh, mini pods, actually, on her Patreon or she just likes to shoot the shit with us. But, you know, this is her, not her public debut, but it's her public debut on this new feed. Uh, but, yeah, you know, Claire has been on a lot of episodes. We did a silent voice review. And Claire will be making her monthly debut next month in March for Miyazaki Month. Yes. So, Claire, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. I'm realizing that <laughs> anyone who listens to this podcast... Probably thinks that I'm just some kind of weeb, which I am, but I still think it's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Claire is a big fan of anime, as is uh, a lot of other people that have been on this show. She is a friend of mine, very close friend, who I've made this year, and I've had her come on the show m- countless times, and she's very natural when it comes to this microphone. So, I, of course, I had to bring her on to talk this movie. Well, not talk this movie, because she's the one who chose this movie, right, you know? Uh, so I had to bring her on the show. So welcome, Claire, to the Cinema Condition. Yes. And because it is the first five episodes after this five, for the last first five, I'm not going to keep explaining this. But Cinema Condition is different than a lot of shows uh, on the Nerdcore Podcast Network. On Cinema Condition, we're not here to talk about the movie if we liked it or not. We're not here to review a movie. We're really here to analyze the themes of a movie and talk about what the movie means to us. And if those themes were well represented in the film. So today, we are going to be taking a look at Summer Wars, which was your choice. Claire, when do you remember your first time you watched Summer Wars? Uh, I was still at the University of St. Thomas, so Mm -hmm. it was sometime before fall 2017, and we were like, me and a bunch of friends were like hanging out in my dorm room, and at the time, my roommate brought like a big screen TV, yeah. And, like, set it up on her dresser. So we, like, hooked up someone's computer. And someone was like, oh, I heard about Summer Wars. Yeah. So we, wa- we like, sat down and watched Summer Wars. And we were like, this is the trippiest thing. Like, <laughs> Yep. So rewatched it today with me. You rewatched it today with me, and I watched it for the first time. Uh, the mm-hmm. film was directed by Momoru Hosada. And I'm going to introduce you guys to director Momoru Hosada here today. So, of course, he was born September 19, 1967, which makes him 51 years old. And uh, he is, what's it called? He started his career as an animator. Uh, he's done a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff with animation. Uh, really didn't start his career making feature-length films. He was making, like, 20-minute TV films and 20-minute videos uh, for animation. Uh, he was inspired by the first film of Hayao Miyazaki, uh, the Castle of Cagliostro, oh, wow. which is what inspired him in his route to become an animator. Uh, he studied oil painting at the Kanazawa College of Art, and he would uh, land a job at Toei Animation even though he applied to work at Studio Ghibli, which he would end up going Ooh. to work later, and then he would leave that job and then go to Toei again. Ooh, uh, but Toei's a big one. Even though he was rejected from... Studio Ghibli, he received a letter of praise from none other than our favorite grumpy, grumpy grandpa, Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was supposed to direct Howl's Moving Castle. And he was le- he, he left the project in the summer of 2002 due to uh, some conflict with the way that the film was supposed to be made. Uh, they really wanted him to make it in the style of Miyazaki, but Hosada really wanted to make the movie he wanted to make. And what happened is in the summer of 2002, they basically, Studio Ghibli said he failed to make a picture that was acceptable to them to have a vision for the film. So he was let go. 
And he had his featured debut in 2000 with Digimon the movie. He, had, he would animate a lot of Digimon. Uh, I remember Digimon the movie very well. Uh, his famous works include 2006's The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, which Ooh. Claire has also watched. Um, Summer Wars in 2009, which is the one film we are discussing today. Wolf Children in 2012. And of course, his 2018 Academy Award, Award nominated film for Best Animated Feature, Mirai. So that is the career of Mr. Mamoru Hosada. And Claire, at the end of this episode today, you're going to you're going to have the choice of recommending a film to the to the people. But also you get to call dibs on a movie for season two. Ooh. So just think about it as we talk today. Oh, It'll gosh. be at the end of the episode. So many possibilities. So many. Like I said, you know, it's just one that you get to call dibs on at the end of the episode. I should have told you this before air, but this is the fifth <laughs> episode. We're going to go ahead and just get a little bit, you know. We're trying to find our food, find our footing here. Footing. I, I was going to say footing. Uh, <laughs> just yeah. jump in. Just throw both feet in the water. Yeah. So, you know, after to th- after this episode, things are going to get a little bit different here, guys. There are going to be nice little commercial breaks where you'll hear uh, commercials for the other shows on the Nerdcore podcast feed, so you can go listen to them. But for now, we're going to go ahead and get into this movie. Uh, Summer Wars is about our little, uh, what's it called, teenage protagonist called, uh, what was his name? Fuck, I just finished watching this movie. Oh, my God, uh, we just watched it. <laughs> I forgot yeah, his name. <laughs> well... Let's go ahead and introduce first our female protagonist here. Uh, our female protagonist is called Natsuki. Uh, and Natsuki, what's it called, is in search for somebody to help her with a part-time job. Mm-hmm. And that part-time job is to get somebody to be her pretend fiancé as she goes over for the summer to celebrate her grandma's 90th birthday. And... Yeah, people, what's it called? He finds these two guys. One of them is really, really into Natsuki. It's his dream girl. Like, that's 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 his girl. You know, he really likes her. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, he, he what's it called? He says yes. And oh, it was uh, Koiso, Kenji. Kenji Koiso. Uh, Kenji. Kenji says yes. and But he didn't know that he was agreeing to be Yeah, he Beyonce. didn't know. He was just like, hey, I get extra work, he was right? He like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they, what's it called? Kenji works as a code operator for Oz, which seems to be this very big thing that connects everything in Japan. It's a game, but it's also, you know, connects with email, calls. Every little thing that is going on in Japan is operated by Oz. It's basically the entire internet. Yes, it's basically. basically Google. It's ba- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. Google mixed with Disney. Yeah. And what's it called? As, he, as Natsuki takes Kenji and introduces him to the family. Some some things come up, and, you know, they, it is found out that not, that Natsuki brought a fake person to be her fake fiancé. But other than that, there's also the end of the world coming as a hacker has stolen accounts, and one of them being military accounts for the United States to launch a nuke into Japan. And that is Summer Wars. Um, Claire, I... Really, really dug this movie. It's a really good movie. I yeah. really like it. There's a lot of things going on in this movie. It's really heartfelt. It's a uh, oh, I I saw this. I thought it was my my mug <laughs> thrown. I was like, what happened? Did I drop my mug? Not no, quite. no, no, not <laughs> quite. Um, it's a very beautiful movie. It's very uh, a lot of themes about you know family, mm. um, internet dependency. Really, a lot yeah, of it too. A lot of that. Yeah. But, you know, there's also stuff like, you know, uh, there's a lot of patriarchal stuff in here, too. Really, like, the woman's role of having to get married. Like, the only reason she really brings this guy over is because her family keeps nagging her that, you know, get married, get married, get married, get married, have kids. Yeah, and then and she brings him home and, like, half the family's like, who is this guy? Yeah. And why is he here? Yeah. But there's also a lot of things about masculinity in this movie, too, which is, is really, really interesting. Um and yeah, I want to I want to get your thoughts first. You know, like, uh, I I really dug the character of uh of Kenji Natsuki too, but uh, Kenji's this really like soft spoken, very awkward teenage boy who is really getting to spend a good while with his girl of his dreams, being a fake fiance, and he's like, he's also tasked with being like the guy who needs to save the world, which is, like, pretty much the 
one hundred percent the generic uh, anime protagonist. <laughs> Very much so. I like the way that they handled that though, because here's this like like super awkward like teenage guy who basically knows nothing about anything except computers, and that's like half the people that I know from high school. And mm. then like I don't know. I like the way that they handled him like having to save the world because they set it up like he'd have to yeah and then he kind of like delegated tasks to Mm -hmm. people and i thought that was really cool yeah so it shows that i think osada is also showing that this kid is a very family oriented even though he like he says his family isn't always there you know they don't eat eat dinners together you know everybody's doing their own thing but he's got he's had to really learn how to how to you know facilitate a family and it really shows in the movie when he's like dele- delegating like different tasks to everybody so that they can make sure that everything works out well and the world is saved. Uh, I really liked I really liked that about uh, about uh, Kenji. I think that that's what makes him look pretty good. Natsuki, on the other hand, is really um what's it called? Um, I I like Kat- Natsuki. I think she's basically the generic what's it called? The female she's protagonist. Just, like, generic female in an anime, like yeah. I did not care for Natsuki. You didn't. No. 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 I th- I think that I think that she I think her heart is in the right place. It's a little mm-hmm. bit. It's just that it's hard to really understand cuz you know like she 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 gets jumped with like two things. The world's about to end and your fucking grandma died. Like, you know, how can you really, you know, like go with, through that at the same time? It's it's pretty tough. Uh, she's bratty though, but you know she's yeah. She seems to be a thing in the family too, which is interesting. And I and I think now we get to talk about like these themes. Um, you know, there's a big theme about family in here. You know, families first. The mm-hmm. the what's it called? They even tell you the 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 whole history of the family, how they and they held down all these different uh, what's it called clans and these wars and you know just this kind of always enforcing the idea that you know the, what we do is for the good of the family and really kind of like very centralized inside the movie yeah i really like that about it because it was is like in a lot of these anime and stuff where the protagonist is like oh you have to save the world like family gets forgotten and a lot mm-hmm. of them and it like loses that like family orientedness or if you like um because one of the going off on the slight tangent no nah, go 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 um one of the anime that this sh- movie reminds me of is sword art online mm-hmm. which I don't think you've watched, have you? Okay, so the the whole premise of Sword Art Online is that, like, they create this video game where you put on this headset and it, like, immobilizes your body in real life. And so you go into this game that's, like, virtual reality and it's, like, you're actually, like, in the game as your avatar. And the whole premise is that they get stuck in the game. And so for at least the first, the original premise, it, like, spun off, but, like... In the original premise, they spent like two years in the game and someone had to beat the game. Mm-hmm. And it was very, it started off very not family oriented because the main character is very like estranged from yeah. his family. But over the course of the anime and everything that he goes through, you see him like kind of start to focus more on like, oh, like family is everything because like you could lose them at yeah. any point. And then he gets back to reality and his family is like his entire world. Yeah. So it's like a lot of anime either do something like that or they just kind of don't have a family focus at all. Yeah. So it's really, really cool to see how central the family is in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a big thing, too, with uh, just, you know, um, what's it called? Because uh, this movie reminds you, not the end of the world aspect, you really, the family reminds you of Lulu Wang's, uh, Wang's, uh, Wang's uh, The Farewell, uh, my favorite movie of last year. It, uh, you know, very centralized on family, uh, which in it's in it you see it when when the family loses the grandma, uh, they they really what's it called? They feel it. They re- they really feel it. You know, everybody's mm-hmm. connected with each other. There's only one person who hasn't really been that involved with the family, but everybody is coming all all their way from all different parts of the world, what's it called? All different parts of Japan to come and celebrate the 90th birthday for their grandmother, and they're there for the funeral as well. And it's just it's just the importance of how like family is structured, you know. Kenji doesn't understand that. That's why he that's why he really appreciates when they when they even bring him around and they even let him eat dinner with them, and he see, it seems to be a very thing that makes him bond with the family, even though he's kind of there just to be a fake fiance, 
you know, he didn't know that that's what he was there for. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, yeah, it's, it's the whole theme and the whole, like, you know, the idea of family to this movie is just so present. It, from, like, the kids playing with each other because they're cousins or their brothers and sisters to the uncles and aunts, you know, talking with each other and having a good time, having a good, like, a drink. Or, you know, the grandmother being the patriarchal, what's it called, How, what's it called, a figure in the household, being the one in the middle, the, what's it called, at the table. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very, very interesting imagery here that we see with the family. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did that stuff kind of stick out to you? Um, it, well, what stuck out to me about the family is how realistic they were. Yeah. Because, like, for every, per, every like, member in the family, I could kind of pinpoint, like, oh, I have a member of my family that's yeah. just like that. You yeah. know? And that's kind of, like, really cool to see. <laughs> yeah. I, I kept making fun of the guy with the, with the, with the was, was it the uncle, the, the sensei? The one with the like the, the generic dad look, the, oh the my wife God. beater, I mean, the muscle we, shirt and the, <laughs> the muscle shirt and the uh in the in like the pl- the pants. Like we all have geez. a relative that dresses exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, my dad to be my dad, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, dude, it's 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 great. I was like, oh my God, you got the stereotypical. You got the kids who won't shut the hell up. You yeah. know, you've got the what's it called the the aunt there who needs to do everything for the like it, everything needs to be done for the family you know like you know even when the world's ending you're like why would you think about that you know <laughs> or the grandmother just yeah. died like get get to work on on helping uh, what's it called on doing the funeral services yeah yeah and then you have the one that just watches sports like yeah. all the time yeah just like kind of <laughs> just there at the tv just watching things like you know like oh, okay yeah, yeah. I'm just like world's yeah. about to end my grandmother just died but let me watch this game but like this game just went into like its 15th ending so yeah yeah <laughs> that fucking game was taking so fucking long <laughs> um it's yeah that was really really uh awesome about, about the movie about the movie i really like that part about it uh I think mm. that's that's the main thing that I think it's it's really really central in the movie. It's just the family, but also you know the whole because everything's happening because we're all connected to the internet. You know, mm-hmm. it's because everything is dependent on the internet and everything is happening because of the internet. So when the hacking happens, it's like, what the hell are we supposed to do? Yeah, like what do we do with this? Like our entire lives are on this thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's fine. It's interesting because the grandma is the one who pulls out the phone books and stuff, and they're like. All right, cool. Time to get everybody, you know, make sure everybody's okay and stuff. Like, while everybody's like, you know, how are we going to do this if the internet's not working and stuff like that? Um, Mm -hmm. Really, it's interesting because this movie came out in 2009. Mm -hmm. Imagine this movie would have been made today uh, because I feel like the internet in 2009 was very, very different from the internet now because now we have like Alexa's. We have Alexa's. We have uh, Google. We have Siri. We have. Yeah. Amazon, mm-hmm. like it was funny because it, well, it was interesting because of what's the whole like the whole GPS thing, like oh the GPS is making me go over here, like you don't understand, like now GPS now like it takes you literally there and it's like you know people don't even like can't even read an atlas anymore. Like in 2009, there was people who were able to read an atlas, yeah, but now nobody even no. I'd be surprised that. if anybody even knows what an atlas is. That might be showing my age here, uh, but yeah. It's it's it was really interesting. Like you know, the reason why the grandmother dies is because the monitor was on there. You know, the monitor was through the internet, and because the internet went down, they didn't know that the the grandmother was suffering a heart attack. Like, you know, what could have been easily just you know just having like a heart monitor that was connected to the wall. You know, instead of having it be connected through the internet. You know, it's 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 crazy. And it's, it's, it's crazy how relevant that still is because now yeah. Apple watches and stuff can actually track all of that health yeah. stuff, you know? Yeah, how, how many times I got to open my phone and it tells me you walked, oh, like, 5,000 steps a day or something like that. <laughs> yeah, or I yeah. open my Fitbit and it tells me, like, my heart rate and how yeah. I slept and everything. It's scary. It's, it's scary. It's scary to think that, like, that could actually happen. Yeah, because, you know, the Internet is, a, even though it's been, it's been, we've had the Internet for a while, it's a very new thing, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a very new concept. The idea of a country having their nuclear, what's it called, nuclear bombs be traced to the internet. What if somebody is able to hack it and be able to do something like that? That would be terrifying. It's terrifying, yeah. It, it makes you think about, like, you know, just, it also makes you think about the assholes who live on the internet. Like, who the hell needs all these accounts? Like, it was like 400, 500 million something accounts. Like that's, but that's like, the thing. It wasn't like, it wasn't a human running, what was it called? Love machine? Love machine. The oh, fucking, okay, we need to go on a tangent about that yeah, real love quick. love machine. Because like, <laughs> the villain's name is Love Machine. Very ironic because he's doing something not out of love. Yeah. Uh, he just wants to fucking end the world, he's I guess. He's just like fucking shit up. 
Yeah. And his name is Love Machine. Love Machine. Like, yeah. And he's got a heart in the middle of his forehead. Like, I, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so okay. it's, it's weird. Like, you know, you just look at it and it's like, it's crazy, you know? Cause like, mm. what, what would happen to us? If our Fitbits don't work anymore, if our, what's it called? If our Alexas don't work, if our, we don't have social media for a couple of days, like. If our know, entire internet just goes haywire. Yeah, yeah, like information's on there. We have, what's it called? Our, like our, our school is done on there. Our schooling is done on there. Like yeah. what happens to us? Like, you know, how, how are we able to, you know, like operate some of the stuff that we need? Because, you know, even like um, things, I, I don't know, because I, I don't really know, like, you know, emergency things, but like. You know, what's it called? What if hospitals were to be traced with the internet, right? And the only way yeah. you were able to get to the hospital is by having to book a visit with the internet, with the, what's it called, with the, with a website, you know? Like, mm-hmm. what would happen to a person if suddenly the internet is gone and they can't book a visit to the hospital because they don't have phone lines anymore or whatever, right? You know, it, it really gets you thinking. I mean, not just that, but in this, like, in this movie, it's not just like, the things that like we have on the internet, they have like their entire, like the entire world is on the internet. Like when the internet goes haywire, like people's, the elderly's, um, yeah. what is it? Life alert starts yeah. acting up and they start messing with the traffic lights and the emergency services and like yeah. all of those things. And it's like crazy to think about how like now in 2020, we're not that far off from having all of that online. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if it's on some kind of online thing. Yeah, like a cloud server or stuff like that, yeah. you know? Because it's, it's it's wild. It's, like, especially with the whole, you know, with the elderly people, like, you know? Or, like, I keep saying, you know, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> there we go again. Um, yeah, you think, like, what if, like, the life alert thinks it's it, this many times that it's calling, it's crying wolf, right? Mm-hmm. What if the time it's actually happening, they're like, oh, no. It's a stupid thing, internet going off again, you know. It's, I'm not going to go this time, you know. Well, fuck I mean, it. it's their job. They have to go anyway, but, like, yeah. how, like. But just imagine, if there was that one person who was, like, on the clock, and they're like, ah, fuck it, this thing's been giving me a pain in the ass all week. It's probably just beeping because of a, because of a steward malfunction. Well, not and even it, that, but, like, what if someone's in actual trouble? Yeah. And they can't get to them because of all the other ones going off that yeah. don't mean shit. Exactly. Like, exactly. That's awful. Which is awful. It, it just shows that, like, you know, just there's kind of limitations to technology as we, uh, you know, kind of advance. And uh, mm. which, you know, advancement is really important thing. I think us as people, we have to advance. We have to have, like, you know, we can't stay in the same shit every single time. But there's kind of, like, those scary things that come with adva- what's called the technological advancements. And, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's really, uh, it's, it's a really scary, scary thing because, you know, it's like, this isn't a thing that isn't, you know, far off. Yeah, this isn't a thing that's not feasible. Like, yeah. It's something that could exist is the really yeah. scary thing. Yeah. Uh, it's what I, like, when I watch her, um, her, like, I, I constantly think about, like, dude, the possibility of a dude falling in love with a computer. Like, it's possible. Like, you have mm-hmm. people who, you know, they've had, like, three, four years of relationship over Facebook and never met. Like, Yeah, never even heard the other person's voice. Yeah, like, yeah, I had, a, I had a friend like that. Yeah? Yeah, he, like, had a whole relationship, a whole four-year relationship <laughs> with someone that he never heard her voice, he never met her in person. Yeah. And we were like, dude, you're fucking stupid. Like, yeah. And he was like, oh, no, it's fine. I talked to her friends. I know she doesn't cheat. And I'm like, first of all, if you have to talk to her friends... To know she doesn't cheat. That's a problem in itself. Yeah. <laughs> that also makes me wonder, like, is the person even real? Like, you know? Yeah, right? Because that could be anyone just, like, catfishing the hell out of you. Yeah, here. and that, that shit happens. Like, people don't believe it. Like, you know, you get, people get catfished, man. Oh, yeah, that happens yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's wild. Like, be, like, that stuff happens. Like, there's people who, like, no, I don't want a video message. You know, like, our relationship is strictly on messages. <laughs> and that's it. Like, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, what's it called? The uh, phone calls. There's no video messages. You know, I'm not going to visit you. Like, it's it's wild. You know, it's something that the world. It's it's like you said. It's feasible. It's yeah. possible. It's feasible. It's possible. It has happened. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't know. It's just crazy to think about. Mm-hmm. This was my introduction to Osada's uh, what's it called filmography. Uh, I know you've watched The Girl Who Left Her Time. I've never seen that one. 
Uh, this was part of my 75 Films from Asia Challenge, so I'm glad that you chose this one because I got to knock two birds with one stone here. Um, I am very interested in, in his animation style. It's really, like, very modern. You know, it's not, it's not the Ghibli style. It also isn't, you know, the uh, Shinkai style. It's very modern, very, uh, not rough. Uh, it's very beautiful looking. It but is. it's it's beautiful looking in like the simple way where you're like you're just seeing a regular ass drawing that somebody made. It's not incredibly abstract like Shinkai's work, but it's also not very nostalgic like Miyazaki's work. If you catch my drift. Yeah, it's it's like it's it's visually like it's stunning because mm -hmm. of how like bright it is. Yeah. But the artwork itself is very simple. Yeah. Which I, I still need to watch Mirai because it's like, you know, it's this big one that he got nominated for. So I I don't know where, when I'll get to that, but I'll get to it eventually. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's I, I really, really like, uh, the characterization is I mean, nothing really different than, you know, most animes, which is interesting. But it's, he really approaches the way that he sets up these characters interesting. Like, you know, I thought throughout the whole thing like you know this thing is actually gonna fucking fall and it pretty much did but like you're like this shit's about to kill everybody here like for a sec because like even with movies like Miyazaki's movies like there's some moments when you can feel like oh yeah things are gonna get resolved yeah for sure or like with Shinkai oh with Shinkai uh like yeah what's it called they're gonna fall in love and they're gonna stay together of course it's gonna happen but with this one I didn't know like I, I at one point yeah. I was like I think for sure you this thing's gonna kill him. Yeah, because they get down to like the wire. Yeah, and it's like, oh, <laughs> these yeah. bitches are gonna die. <laughs> yeah, which I think it's Hosada kind of saying that, like in life, it's not that you know cookie cut. It's not that cut. It's not that well cut. You know, mm -hmm. like shit doesn't always just go according to plan. You know, sometimes the plan gets messed up. Sometimes somebody takes ice out of your supercomputer room. And moves it to the grandma's room where she's where the body's still there. That's so creepy. Yeah, you know sometimes <laughs> life messes up, and you know sometimes you have to find uh, another way. You might have to call that uncle that you know nobody talks to because he's been out of the house for ten years, and it's really really interesting what uh, those little those little parts that he uh, he brings into the film, Osada. Mm. Um, yeah, um, I've got more stuff here. I wanted to talk about you know the masculinity too because. Uh, but the masculinity, but also you know the role of the woman in the film, especially uh, the 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 mothers like you know cooking and cleaning. The, you know the one that gets to watch the the game is interesting because it's like wow, the only one who's not being told to come back into the kitchen. You also have the pressure on the uh, on Natsuki to marry and to find a uh, to find a uh, what's called a partner to have ch child children with, and also the pressure on what's it called on. Uh, on 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 Kenchi, she's yeah. supposed to be this very man up, like he's supposed to be like this very masculine, tough dude. Yeah, they who expect can him to who can protect her. Yeah, and it's like you know, like she can fucking protect herself. Yeah, she doesn't need protecting. <laughs> yeah, like damn, girl, you're a fucking grown ass girl, dude. She can yeah. Protect yourself. It's really interesting. What did you think about that in the movie? I thought it was really. I think it's really interesting how they. Okay, so there's a few things that I'd like to say about this particular thing but like i thought it was really interesting how the men all kind of like preached masculinity but they didn't actually do much until like the very end and then you see them like kind of start to come together and be like one yeah. of them actually even says like the men in this family have gotten complacent yeah and then they like rise to the challenge and it's really interesting how they preach all of this like masculinity and like oh she needs to get married and have kids but yeah. then the grandma is like the single most badass female. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. It's like you've got a you got a whole family of men who are basically just letting their wives do all the work, you know. Yeah. And they're supposed to be like, oh dude, you gotta be tough. You gotta protect your girl. Like, you know, like what the hell are you guys talking about then? Like basically you guys are just like sitting back relaxing while your girl while your wife does everything for you. Yeah. Like but then like also like sorry. Nah, but nah, go ahead. But contradicting that a little bit too, because they so okay how do i put this <laughs> speak your truth speak your truth but they like they did all that but at the same time these men are like like the 
stereotype dad character yeah like knows karate or kung fu or whatever that is <laughs> and then like the other men there's like three firefighters in the family yeah. and one of them like works for some government agency doing some undisclosed job yeah and the, the, the what's it called the secret uh, the, the what's it called the self-defense secret so yeah self-defense thing yeah yeah self-defense something or other yeah. and when they ask him what he does he's like that's it's classified cl- <laughs> <laughs> they're like i've heard that before oh, we had a course. family friend in the marines and yeah. he was a translator and every t- my brother used to pester him every time he came in on leave and be like what do you do what did you do like and he's like i i can't tell you it's classified he was like i literally can't tell you anything <laughs> that's interesting yeah but it's 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 really uh surprising what you bring up like yeah like you know these and especially uh what's it called uh, uh um kazama's uh king kazama's his dad he's not even not there the whole movie in like but there's also that mm. pressure on these kids growing up because you see when he fails, when he gets his account taken, mm. he says, I, 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 could, I failed you, Grandma. I couldn't protect Mom. I couldn't protect my sisters. You yeah. know, it's kind of setting this idea to boys, like you're supposed to be this very tough, very macho. You're supposed to very much protect your family, protect the women in your family, and, you know, be, like, there to... Uh, to make sure that they have the right life they need to have. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. You see the pressure that it brings to these little boys in the family. Yeah, it's interesting that they do that, too, because, like, none of those women need protecting. Pretty much. Like, these are yeah. all, like, all the women in this movie, except for, like, a few scenes with Natsuki. They're very, like, strong, independent women. Yeah. And it's, that's actually, like, going off on a slight tangent again. <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry. It all relates to the movie either way. Yeah, but, like, the baseball girl i don't know what her name is but i'm just gonna call her red Sox girl because she's wearing a red Sox jersey like a heathen the whole movie yeah but um she's kind of she's a really interesting character by herself because they paint her as this very non-feminine kind of woman who's like she's watching a baseball game this whole time i think it's her son that's playing in the game because it's like a high school televised baseball game Mm -hmm. and She's watching this the whole time, but then you have this one scene where she's, like, after the grandma dies, when they're all, like, chilling in their, like, somber silence, and they zoom in on her breastfeeding her baby. And I thought that that was really interesting, and not just because, like, personally, I've never seen, like, breastfeeding shown on screen in an anime movie. never seen it before, either. Never seen it before. So that's interesting in and of itself, but it's just, like, it's interesting how they contradicted this like very non-feminine character with this very feminine task of like oh she's breastfeeding her child you know yeah it's it's really interesting what you bring up because i i can't remember the last time i've seen that in an anime film or even anime in general or in any film yeah but it's true because like what somebody could say like well i'm pretty sure it's happening in the films we just i mean i'm sure it it has i'm sure it's happened in anime too yeah but like we just haven't haven't watched it yet yeah (laughs) but it's it's interesting because you know she is a very tomboyish character you know she's kind of like you know if you what's it called just watching sports all the time Mm -hmm. she's not really you know doing the cooking and cleaning she's not really even hanging out much of the time with the women in the family she's kind of really just drinking beer you know with the guys and you know she's also watching sports but then you have her doing like the most, like the most, uh, like the peak the most of feminine natu- things. Yeah, the yeah. most natural thing that could come to a woman. Mm-hmm. It's like breastfeeding, and it's 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 oddly beautiful in a way, you it know, is. because it's kind of Hosada showing like you know, everybody in the family is different, but like you know, at the end of the day, we're we're still who we are. You know, we're still mm-hmm. you know we're still mothers. We're still fathers. We're still. There's still what's more to us than what's on the surface. Yeah, we're still sons. We're still daughters, you know? Uh, and, and I guess it's just him reminding, like, this is still a family, even though there's a, what's it called? The, the cousin ruins everything, basically. Yeah. And the world is ending and a nuke's about to land on your house. Yeah. But, like, they're all against Natsuki, you know, bringing some fake guy, fake boyfriend, you know? they. But still, at the end of it all, it all comes from a place of wanting to make sure that everything works out for the family mm-hmm. and that they all... They all, what's it called? Up. Uh, they all make sure that it's, you know, that it's all approved by the the, the grandmother, which is really interesting because I, I put down a quote here that they say that I really wanted to bring up. Uh, what's it called? Mother's permission is all the approval she will need. You know, it's like because I don't know how it works with you. You know, my friend. It's like always, you know, there was mom, mm-hmm. but there was grandma. 
grandma was higher than everybody. Like, <laughs> if grandma didn't like something, it gets changed in an instant. You know, forget it, mom doesn't like it. But if grandma doesn't like how it is, there's like, it's just how, how we view the elderly, but also how we view the, you know, the, the main figure in the family, which is always the, what they call the grandparents. Mm-hmm. You know, and in this case, she's also the great grandparents to some of them. But, you know, it was really interesting what they say like that. You know, it doesn't matter if Natsuki's mom doesn't approve of what she did, of what of the guy she brings. If our if if Nazi's grandmother approves of the man she brings, fuck what the mom said. <laughs> what did you think about that? I think well, I didn't really think much about that to be honest until you said all that just now. Yeah, and now I'm thinking that that's a really interesting cultural difference. Yeah, because I've noticed in like in movies like like Coco and yeah. like movies about like the Mexican culture and movies about like Japanese culture yeah. and like basically any culture that's not American. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the grandmother or the grandfather is kind of the central figure of the family. But for me, like growing up in Texas with like our little like Cajun family, mm-hmm. it's never been like the grandparents as the central figure. It's always been like, oh no, mom's the central figure. Like she's the final authority. Yeah. Like dad's there and his approval matters, but like yeah. mom's like God, yeah. you know? Yeah. Which is crazy because in my defense over here, my grandma's the, the big authority. Like, you know, what's it called? It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, you know, it's, what's it called? Grandma could not like how a certain thing looks. If they if she doesn't like that the house that the house that they're doing Christmas at a certain house, well shit. Looks like we're gonna have to move things over. We're gonna have to go to a different place for Christmas or something like that. It's it's really interesting. And I think that's just how it is, especially in the East, uh, the Eastern world. And uh, mm. it's it's really interesting when you when 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 you get to these movies. By the way, we watched it in dubbing. I really wish we could have watched it in the in the sub because I really wanted to hear those original voice actors. But there you were know, some really good voice actors in this one, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it's just interesting the way that they kind of show the East in this world, in this film. You know, very, uh, very industrialized, very, uh, very, very technological, but also very family oriented. And mm-hmm. it's a, uh, it's not the first time you see movies like this. You know, you see, see them all the time with Miyazaki. You know, you see them all the time with uh, Shinkai. Really, you know, the aspect of you know how tight knit family is and. I, I gotta say that it was really, really, really interesting when, how how the family is affected when uh, when the grandmother died. Yeah, because they kind of lose that central authority. Yeah. So it's interesting. I know. I, I like I've seen this movie before, but like I told Raúl when we were watching yeah. it, I didn't actually remember anything about it because I watched it like years ago. Mm-hmm. And when the grandma died, I was kind of like, "Well, shit! Like, who's gonna take over now?" Because like she was like the big decision maker. Yeah. She was, you know, the big kahuna. And yeah. it was kind of like, well, what are they going to do now? Like, are they going to split apart because their central figure is gone? Mm-hmm. Or are they going to come together around the loss? Yeah. And they kind of did both a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's it called? You know, uh, Uncle Wabiske, you know, you know, the very the outcast of the family, the one who's been shunned and everything. But <laughs> even then, in that, in that letter from the grandmother, he's like, I set them back, you know, you know. Yeah, she's let, like, just forgive and forget. Yeah, just feed them, let them come, you yeah. know, just, just to set them back. And it's it's interesting because it reminds me of like you know, in family there can be so many grudges. There can be grudges, but like as long as you know, if you just have a conversation, and you talk about it. Usually, things can get solved in that in that day when you have that conversation. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting when you know you read the letter from the grandma and basically they're like. Yeah, you know what? It's time to call Wabi's game, bring him back and help us out because we really do need his help. And even though we do feel a certain way about him, he has the right to come and pay his respects to his to his grandmother. But they don't even make that decision. It's just Natsuki who like calls him. Yeah. And she's like, hey man. And then he's like, he goes off on his tangent and she's like, Would you shut the fuck up? Uh, yeah, and- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, Claire had the uh, her her wonderful, wonderful First time seeing me cry during a movie. <laughs> I promise it's not the first. It's not the last time you're gonna see it. So, uh, you know, it was. Uh, so, it, I mean, this because this movie really struck me. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. I lost my grandmother last year. You know, she was the mm-hmm. woman who raised me. You know, she was the one who raised me and my brothers. And 
you know, she she of course she was the patriarchal figure of our family. You know, it was it's really tough. So when, you know, you see Natsuki really shocked at first. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't know what to make of it. Yeah. And then that one part where all the family is kind of mourning. You know, the mother's breastfeeding. We go to Natsuki where she's crying. But she finally has a chance to let it all out. Yeah, yeah. and she, like, lets um, Kenji in yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And that's a really, that's a, that's a really interesting scene by itself. Yeah, which is what reminds me of, you know, when I was at the hospital with my grandmother. And uh, where I had that moment where I had to let it all out. You know, mm -hmm. fuck, I was still crying when I came back to my room. Uh, when I was living at the lofts at the time, you know, I just got to my room. I just fucking closed the door. I came back after coming back from fucking San Antonio. And I just fucking let it all out and let it all out. Fucking crying in my room. And mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's really, it's really interesting scene because, you know, it's, she's, she's, she's being so vulnerable. But at the same time, mm -hmm. she's letting this guy in. And he's kind of like, you know, I brought you here yeah. because of just trying to make my family accept you. And now I'm basically making you part of my family now. Because yeah. you're here during, like, one of the toughest time of my family. During the toughest time, yeah. probably. Yeah, probably the toughest time, the toughest time that our family's going to go through. So I thought that that was really uh, interesting and really beautiful that Hosada includes that in his movie. Yeah, that was really, really cool. Yeah. It's like she had to see me cry, but oh, well, it's going to happen <laughs> another time. I'm pretty sure. We're all human. It happens. It happens. My friends, what's it called? Man cry, all right? My fellow men who are listening to this, you got to cry, guys. We got to let it out. You know, there's nothing wrong with crying. You know, absolutely nothing. I cry more times than I need to. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, dude, it's uh, this, this, this movie handles that so well. And I I can't believe that, you know, that I've been sleeping on Hosada for a while. You know, I, I, mm. I've i only seen movies from Shinkai and Miyazaki. You know, we did uh, The Garden of Words on the, on this podcast with uh, with Michelle. Uh, I saw Weathering with you, uh, and of course I've seen a shit ton of Miyazaki more than I need to. <laughs> of course, haven't we all? Yeah, we, I mean that's Grumpy Grandpa. That's the guy who really has made anime films big as they are. Oh, absolutely. He's part of the reason that anime itself is as big yeah. as it is. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason this guy even makes these movies because he yeah. was inspired by Miyazaki's first film by <laughs> the Castle of Cagliostro. Yeah, that's a wild movie. That's a trip of a movie. Yeah, yeah, it really <laughs> is. Uh, the Castle of Cagliostro is crazy. Uh, but you know, you you really think about just the way that the, that the movies are or the what's it called the the, the subject matter is presented, and I think that Hosada is very strong in that sense. It's a first strong, first uh, first outing from him that I've seen that was really, really strong. And I wanted to see more of his movies because, I, I I mean, there's no way that Mirai was nominated just for just because it's Mirai. Like, there's got to be more to it. Like, there's probably more in that movie that I need to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got a couple of stuff here that I got to bring up, too. You know, I, it's really interesting how, you know, the city, you know, where they're at. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all kind of like disorganized. The room that they're that they're what's it called? That the room that they're working in, and then you come to the room where Kazama has his computer. And it's all very knit and organized and everything, and it's kind of showing you the difference between the city life and also the, the you know the rural life. You know, the, fuck, the fucking country. It's mm -hmm. it's I re and it's also beautiful the way that they that they animate that place. You know, it looks like a huge, huge, huge like uh, house. And it probably is. Yeah, it brings a boat. I thought that was hilarious. I'm like, why do you never get a boat? Why they never use the boat? Why is the boat there? <laughs> uh, the boat was really housing the ice, but other than that, really, what the fuck are you using the boat for? Yeah, for real. Um, yeah. Also, I guess this will be the last thing we kind of talk about, and uh, I I think that a big thing this movie was talking about as well was cyber cyber bullies. You know, people who live on the internet just to be fucking assholes. You know. It's like, what happens to technology when it gets into the wrong hands? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a scary thought. I think they, okay, so on that note, I think it's really interesting how it's a Japanese movie, but the like main antagonist actually ends up being the United States military <laughs> because they got their hands, they like bought um, mm -hmm. Love Machine, Love Machine from the cousin who made Love Machine. And then they like released it on Oz thinking that it would be, I don't know, some kind of security measure or something. And yeah. it got way out of hand. 
and then they ended up like hurting a bunch of people. And if that isn't United States history yeah. in a nutshell, I, I was going to ask you: Do you think that's Hosada kind of saying like that America you know, needs to fuck off? Yeah, that basically <laughs> the United States needs to start getting involved in things they don't need to do because they make things worse, worse. But they make things worse than they than they are. You know, I mean, yeah. I can sit here and tell you <laughs> the whole fucking region of Latin America could tell you about how that worked out. Oh yeah, the whole world can. Yeah. Japan can. Yeah, Japan. One exact. One exactly. Japan. You know. Japan can tell better than anyone. Yeah, I mean, what's it called? Look at all the birth defects that came after we dropped a fucking bomb there. You know, like. Yeah. You know, even though you're trying to help and you think it's gonna work. You're messing there's, with things that you don't fully understand. Exactly. And releasing them on the world. Yeah. So you know, it's it's like, it's you know, kind of like a metaphor of imperialism, but at the same time, it's like, you know. What are you doing when you get hands on things you don't understand? You're going to get them into the wrong... Like, you buy something. You buy this Oz, you love mm. machine. Gets into the hands of somebody who can really cause damage. Then you have something like a cyber terrorist attack that almost destroys a whole family and kills kills them off. Like, mm-hmm. that's it's, it's, it's crazy. It shows, like, the limitations of technology, but also what happens when you get them into the wrong hands. Because there's people who abuse of the internet. You know, yeah, like they make they 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 act like assholes. I mean, how many times have we read articles about a person? I can't remember who this was, but what's it called? Uh, somebody there was a, a boyfriend who was texting a girlfriend, mm-hmm. saying that you know he wanted to kill himself and everything like that, right? And the mm-hmm. girlfriend texts back, "You should do it. What's stopping you?" And what there's people like that in this world who abuse okay. the internet and do things like that you know what happens if things like, like there's what if somebody like that who's like a complete sociopath were to get their hands on something that could control a, a nuke falling on a fucking family do you That's remember like, that case i can't remember who it was but yeah the girl got life like fucking because oh there was the whole there I remember the, that. Yeah, there yeah. was the whole debate going if that is manslaughter, which to me it fucking yeah, is manslaughter. I remember that. It's assisted suicide in a sense. It's not I mean, it's suicide baiting. Yeah, basically. But that's kind of all it is because he still had the option of whether yeah. to do it or not. Yeah. It's just it's a really tough thing where 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 we get into like the whole ethics of it and also really how to really categorize it because you know Yeah. The guy was asking for the guy was crying for help. Yeah. And, and she he, should she should have directed him towards some kind of help. Help. Because, I mean, it's not, like, okay, if I were in that situation, like, I would kind of be like, like, I'm sorry that you're going through this. Like, please get professional help. Yeah. Because I wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Even as your partner, you, you don't have the answer to everything. No. And there's things like that where you don't really want to have the answer. Yeah. Because it's easy to tell someone, oh, well, you can live to fight another day. When yeah. you don't know, like, you haven't been inside their head. Yeah. You know? But to say something like, you should do it, what's stopping you? That's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, you yeah. know? It's it, that's it's crazy. That's but fucked. that's what I'm telling you about, like, this whole fucking internet thing that we have. It allows people to... How many fucking times have I seen on Twitter people telling, like, oh, you're fucking stupid for liking this, or you're fucking stupid like that. You know, you don't know how that fucking... You know, that how that affects somebody throughout their day. Like, you... Of course, it's some random stranger telling you, but you know, some people are having a certain day and they're having a bad day and getting told on the internet, oh, fucking kill yourself because you like this or fucking kill yourself because you like that. You know, it's kind of like, what the fuck, man? I think the whole, the whole internet culture of like, oh, well, you don't like this and that makes your opinion invalid is like really stupid in and of itself. Yeah. But like, that's always going to be there, you know? Yeah, sadly. And like, I mean... I kind of just, I know all of us kind of just, like, grew up with it. So it's kind of just this thought of, like, oh, well, there's strangers on the internet, so just, like, toughen the fuck up. Yeah. But, like, the whole, I've noticed in the past few years especially, there's been that whole rise in the meme of, like, that dude holding his hand up in the suit, and he's like, go kill yourself. (laughs) And I'm just, like, not okay with that on so many levels. Yeah. Because, like, I don't know, like, I've had a lot of, like, personal experience with yeah. oh, suicide you, yeah. and I mean, like you know my personal experiences with it too you know yeah. it's something that's happened before and and but i gotta say you know it's it, it's like where are we going with like where are we going when we get our hands with this technology and like 
and we use it for good. But there's also that part in the film where it's used for good because you see everybody. Yeah, everybody together. bands together. Everybody bands together. And there is those beautiful things about internet culture. There are. Everything is a balance. The per- the guy I, 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 what's it called? I co-host my sh- the show with, the main show, <laughs> on through Twitter. You know, there yeah. there is the beautiful thing about the internet. There are amazing things on the internet if yeah. you find them and look for them. Like, yeah. if you look for darkness, that's all you're going to see. Yeah. Which is possibly what the hacker was looking for. He just wanted, he, he said it. He did it. He's not doing this from a place of like, you know, wanting to, what's it called, make people fear. Like, he's doing it because he wants to. He's, he's, because, well, yeah. I mean, it's an AI. Yeah. It's he like, doesn't. It's not doing anything to feel anything. It's just doing yeah. things because I can. Yeah. Which is really interesting when you when you get down to it, like at the nitty gritty. It's like, you know, when are when are we going to get to that point? You know, because we're already desensitized to so many things. Like how many fucking videos do we see of people getting shot on the Internet? Like, you know, and we're, or people fighting like, you know, like the fucking corner store. Somebody's fighting in the corner store and we're like. Ah, uh, dude, that's funny. It's just like uh, it's just like people wilding <laughs> out, right? Yeah. You no, know, but deep down, you're like, what the fuck, man? Why are you getting to the point where you have to hit somebody? You know, it's like we're kind of getting desensitized to certain things. And we've gotten desensitized to a lot. Yeah. Or our first reaction to like, so, like, I bring up the World War Three thing, right? Mm-hmm. What was our first reaction to that? We make memes out of it. Yeah, but to when be we fair- don't, when we don't think about, you know, if it's a real thing, we have. I have family who could have gotten drafted, who could have been told to go. Got people in the military who were going to told to go fight a war. You know. Well, I mean, but to be fair, the people making the memes were the people at risk of getting drafted, and they knew that. Yeah. yeah. Like comedy isn't comedy like that for our generation. Yeah. Isn't made out of malice. It's like yeah. just dealing with a bad situation through comedy because that's kind of just the best way to deal with things yeah. like that. But it's also at the same time, I kind of pose the question, like, when are we going to actually take something seriously? You know, when are we not going to make everything a joke and try to uh, actually, like, talk about certain things, you know? Because there will be, like, things like, uh, I'm trying to remember certain examples, but um, what's it called? Uh, or, you know, like, yeah, during that things, like, I would see people who were like, no, please don't joke about this. Like I have a my husband's in the military or my wife's in the military and they could go they could die any second because they're out there and they'd be like, Oh, lighten up. Like, why should we have to dictate the way other people like, you know, like they kind of approach the way they're uh, they're handling their own their own uh how can I say it? Like they're handling the news and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean we can't But I can also really. see how that yeah, yeah, I know. I could also see how that kind of being used for like uh you know, people like use memes and stuff like the cult, but yeah. I don't know. I to me, it's like I think, oh, and I and you say you agree with me. Like I think we are getting desensitized to certain things. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we as a culture are desensitized to so fucking much. Yeah, like if someone came over from a culture that's never experienced anything that goes on in America, yeah. and they came here and saw all the things that we joke about, they would probably be yeah. like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? This is a society full of sociopaths." Like, yeah, basically. <laughs> Whereas in the film, you know, and they're like, you know, what the fuck is wrong with you? Know, like, they're not, they're not like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just another guy acting weird on Oz. You know, <laughs> no, it's like, what the hell is wrong with y'all? Like, you know, you're about to kill the whole world, and you know, of course, you have the people who don't like the parents and the family who are like, oh, I don't really know what this is. It's just a game, right? You know, like, no, you dumb man. Like, it's more than that. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting. It's once again, it's really interesting the way he compares the Eastern world and the Western world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, say that we're probably at the end of this. I want to say that we're at. Well, there's one last thing. Something. Yeah, go ahead and bring it up. Okay, so the whole movie, there's a baseball game going on in the background. Yeah. And everything that goes on in the baseball game correlates to the action in the movie. Yeah. And exactly. I thought that was really yeah. interesting. Because, like, even when the baseball game, at the end, they talk about going into extra innings. Yeah. And like that's kind of what's going on in the movie too, because they yeah. thought everything had worked out. Yeah. But they and gave then, that one shot. One yeah. more shot. One more shot. Yeah. And then it just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. And before you know it, they're they went yeah. from like nine innings to like sixteen innings. Yeah. Also, uh Hosada does a lot of um, homages here. Uh he does an homage to uh, Miyazaki in the train. Mm-hmm. He does the shot from Spirited Away. 
Yeah. He also does a nice little, uh, what's it called, uh, homage to Aki, uh, Akira Kurosawa, to the grandmaster of Japanese cinema himself, when he says that when the guy was like, oh, yeah, wh- wh- where'd you find that? Did you make that up? He's like, oh, no, I got it from Seven Samurai. It's oh, homage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, an homage to the movie made by uh, Kurosawa-san, you know, the grandmaster of Japanese cinema. I thought that was really nice of him to put that in there. You know, you know like, hey, you got to pay homage to the greats. Uh, I thought that was great. But yeah, we are here and we you've just gotten through your first movie, uh, first episode of The Cinema Condition, Claire. Yeah. Do you have a movie in mind that you would like to recommend to the people? That I'd like to recommend to the people? Yeah. What's oh a movie gosh. you got to tell them that you got to watch this? Like, it's a really Ooh. good movie. Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> there's so many good movies. Just think about one. Um, Because I'm pretty sure... You'll have more to recommend when you come back. Oh, probably. Definitely. Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. I think uh, everyone should watch Kiki's Delivery okay. Service. All right. Awesome. Um, so you recommend Kiki's Delivery Service. Now, which is the film that you want to call dibs on for season two, Claire? This will be the first movie you come back for season two. Oh. Uh, hmm. Okay. <laughs> At the risk of what you're going to say about this movie because I know oh. you don't like this series, but I love it. It's my religion, so I'm going to say Iron Man. Oh. oh, I don't mind talking about Iron Man. Yeah, Iron really? Man's... Yeah, I thought you were going to choose Avengers Endgame. No. I was like, no, <laughs> Iron Man. Oh, there's yeah, a lot of I conversations mean, to have with Iron Man. There's you know? even longer conversations about Endgame. We could probably talk about Endgame for 10 hours straight. Nah, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> we can do Iron Man. Cool. She uh, she chose Iron Man. I thought you were going to bring up that one. I was like, no, I'm not doing Endgame. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, with Iron Man, there's a lot of conversation to have you had there, especially about, you know, what's called the, mil- the, indu- the military industrial complex. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is the Yas from Claire. She's yes. you know, the, the queen of Yas. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for sticking here, coming up with us. It, I, I love the show. It's really more of a, like a deep understanding of the movie and what really makes the movie the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm glad I brought you here. There are still more chances for you to come back. You yes. know that, that you know there's there's this, if there's another one you want to do. We have five open slots in episode in season one. Because there's 30 episodes, and we have 25 already booked with a, with with guests. But, yeah, you just got to let me know which is the next one you want to do, and we'll have you come on for to, to season one. Yeah. So, you know, just call one of those slots before somebody else does. But, yeah, I'm <laughs> glad you guys have enjoyed the first five episodes of of, uh, of The Cinema Condition. We've had the wonderful Alex- Alejandra Almeida in the first one where we talked about Gaspar Noé's Climax, and then the second one was with Miss Amazing Michelle Ochoa, where we talk about the Garden of Words from Makoto Shinkai, and the third, of course, was our most abstract episode where we call where we talked about Takashi Miike's audition with Leah Burns, Leah Burns, and then of course our fourth episode was the incredible Jabril Newton, co- co-host of the greatest wrestling podcast on on earth. High Flyer Radio, where we talked about blind spotting from Carlos Lopez Estrada. I want to thank my first five guests so much. Like you guys, uh, have made this a really, really fun, fun part of the the show. Things are gonna get a little bit different when we when we move on to the next couple of episodes, but it's still gonna be the same thing. We're gonna be here to talk about a movie. And we're here to analyze the movie and talk about what the movie was about and what made the movie the movie. So. As always, you can go to thenerdcore.com. You check out all the reviews I write on there. I just put a new one for Weathering With You. I, I reviewed that movie. Uh, spoiler alert. Didn't think it was that great. But uh, you guys go read my thoughts on that movie because we need we need you to go read the reviews. That's why they're <laughs> up. Um, you can also check out the other shows on the feed. Uh, the other shows on the, uh, on the network at anchor.fm slash thenerdcore. Of course, you can find this at anchor.fm slash the cinema condition. We're on our own feed. We've got our own playground. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, thank you so much. Make sure you leave a rate or what's called a like on the on the on the like button and you subscribe to the YouTube channel. But if you're listening to this to this on podcast services, especially Apple Podcasts, please go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe to the feed, and leave a five-star review so you can help us. Get this show available to everybody. It helps people find the show easier. And it just, you know, makes me feel good when you guys leave reviews for the show and you tell me what I'm doing right here. 
As always, the Nerdcore is found on Instagram and Twitter. You know, uh, the Nerdcore and the Nerdcore underscore on Twitter. So go and check that out. And you can follow me uh, Instagram and Twitter at the Nerd Gigano. And Claire, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me across any social media by at Lipstick Fedora. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Claire, I wish Claire did more than just, you know, tweet stuff on in, on the internet. I wish she had her own, like, YouTube live stream where she talked about anime and stuff because she's <laughs> she's really knowledgeable. It's just that she doesn't like the camera in front of her. I which don't. is Which is why I think you love this whole podcast thing because yeah. there's nothing like, you know, having to have the, the camera in front of you. Yeah. But I want to thank you so much for joining me. I don't... Oh, wait. I do know what our next episode is. Uh, our next episode is either... Interview with a vampire with a vampire oh, with Miss Rachel Sweetland, or my friend Alejandra Escutia Angulo is going to come on to talk about Inglorious Bastards. Oh, so, those are two really good yeah. movies. <laughs> so sit tight, my friends. Watch your movies in the files. And as always, stay safe out there. It's been the cinema condition, and I'll see you guys next episode.